Today, Sennheiser is announcing a new flagship in-ear monitor that I feel is not just a significant improvement on any previous IEM from Sennheiser, but also one that gives them a contender in the current top tier of the IEM market and that's become one of my reference IEMs. This new IEM is the Sennheiser IE900, and for the IE900, Sennheiser gave a lot of latitude to one of the most capable engineering teams in the industry. And when they do that, it often yields impressive headphones, resulting in many products that have become industry standards and years-long classics. Now before I go any further, I want to make something clear. The Sennheiser IE900 was not tuned to the Harman Target, and I mention this straight away because I think a lot of people are under the impression that everything should be voiced to the Harman Target, and in my opinion, that's not necessarily the case. I think many people in the community looking for quick and easy answers, including reviewers, sometimes misrepresent the Harman Target as an absolute target, where the ideal headphone must land. Now I've seen even some reviewers plotting the difference between the Harman Curve and a given headphones frequency response curve, and of course that's fine. But some assert that the difference curve is essentially an error curve, and the degree to which a headphone deviates from the target is the degree to which it is wrong, more than suggesting then that there's a right and wrong in this context, and that the Harman curve is the one right answer. And I'd say that's a step too far. The Harman target is a great starting point, no doubt, a wonderful baseline. Now the new Sennheiser IE900 again was not tuned to the Harman target, and so does not follow the Harman target closely through significant portions of the audio band, which we'll discuss in more detail later. But you know what other great earphones and headphones don't follow the Harman target? A lot of them, now including the IE900. If you haven't actually read all of the Harman Target associated research, you really should. It's brilliant, incredibly thorough and well-structured, and the best publicly available body of work of its kind. However, I don't think most in our community have read all of it, or even most of it, which perhaps results in what I was talking about earlier, this misuse of the target, sometimes to degrees I'd consider perversions of it. I mean, even when respected reviewers identify certain headphones as matching closely with the Harman curve, I've found it can be done loosely and perhaps raise even more questions rather than bringing more clarity. I was watching a video by a respected headphone reviewer recently who said, if you think about all the headphones that are good headphones, that are well regarded and everybody loves them, most of them end up being something close to the Harman target. And then he mentions as specific examples, the Sennheiser HD600 and 650, the Hi-Fi Man Sundara and Ananda, the Focal Clear and Focal Utopia. Here's the thing though, if you know those headphones, if you've heard all of those headphones, and I have, and I'm sure many of you in this community also have, then you know that those headphones, especially from manufacturer to manufacturer, do not sound alike. I can't imagine anyone listening to the Focal Utopia and Sennheiser HD 650 and comparing them and then concluding that they sound alike. They simply do not. So was it the measurements of them that led these headphones to be grouped together this way, or was it their sound? That's an important question. Last year, in an interview with the National Association of Music Merchants, or NAM, when asked about the Harman Target, Sean Olive gave a succinct description, saying that most people consider the Harman Target to be very neutral, very accurate, and that it's been tuned so that it satisfies roughly 64% of the population. Sean's colleague, Omid Kansarapur, further emphasized the target's neutrality and lack of coloration. Now, would I describe the Harman Target as neutral to the degree that Sean and his colleagues might? No, probably not to that degree, but yes, I would describe it as generally being in the range of neutrality. In my opinion, neutral when it comes to headphones is more of a range than a single voicing, that there's a range within which neutrality exists. And to my ears, the Sennheiser IE900, while not matching the Harman target, sounds more neutral to me than the in-ears I've heard that do match the target closely. That said though, I am definitely among the 64% that generally enjoys and finds satisfaction with headphones and earphones that closely track the Harman target. Because when I do hear headphones and earphones that do track the target closely, I generally quite like them and in some cases even love them. Again though, there are a lot of headphones and earphones that I consider top tier reference pieces that do not track the Harman target. Some do, some sort of do, and well, some do not. The new Sennheiser IE900 is one of the ones that doesn't and yet it's one of my reference IEMs now. Okay, all of that now said, let's take a closer look at the Sennheiser IE900 and some of the key engineering behind it. The Sennheiser IE900 replaces the Sennheiser IE800S, and it's not just a refinement, but an entirely new model, with an entirely new design from the outside with a major shift in form factor to the inside where Sennheiser's acoustical engineers got very creative. Now let's start with the inside. Like their flagship IEMs before it, the Sennheiser IE900 uses a single dynamic driver per side. The 7mm driver configuration inside is unique to the IE900, including a new coil design. 
What's most interesting to me about the IE900's engineering, though, is the evolution of Sennheiser's use of resonators to sculpt the sound signature. It started with the IE800 and then later the IE800S, in which Sennheiser incorporated two chamber absorbers, essentially two Hemholtz resonators, to sculpt the sound, specifically the treble. They also incorporated a resonator in the over-ear HD800's design, released as a new model, the HD800S, back in 2015, which so many of us know and love. Again, in that application, the intent was to sculpt the treble, and they effectively did so, reducing the HD800's peakiness with the HD800S, and as a result, I much prefer the HD800S to the HD800. Earlier this year, Sennheiser announced the IE300, and unlike the resonators in the IE800 and IE800S, which incorporated two smaller chambers in the sound tunnel, where they would obstruct some high-frequency sonic radiation, for the IE300, they went instead with one large resonator chamber integrated into the IE300's plastic nozzle, eliminating the need to put resonator structures in the main path of the sound tunnel, instead opting for a side-volume resonator. The IE900 takes this concept quite a bit further. For the IE900, they've gone with three resonators per side, each with a distinct volume, precision milled as three side volumes branching off the nozzle through slits. If you're interested in ear simulators, this might seem like a familiar concept. While the purposes are different, ear simulators, like the very popular IEC 711 ear simulators, those simulators use side volumes to help shape their response. In the case of the ear simulators, they're intended to help mimic the human eardrum's energy losses. In the case of the IE900's Hemholtz resonator chambers, they're also used to shape the response, but more specifically to precisely sculpt the IE900's treble response primarily above 6 kHz to remove masking resonances. It's brilliant, really, and another example of what Sennheiser's engineers will do when given free reign. Of course, I'll be saying more about the IE900's sound signature shortly. The precision milling required for the chambers is also used to shape the IE900's outer housing, which is now a cable-up concha-type chassis that I definitely prefer to the IE800's straighter-bodied cable-down design. The milling process for the IE900 is demanding. The tolerance is very tight. Using a 5-axis CNC machine, the chassis for each pair of IE900's takes 40 minutes to mill, after which the IE900's are hand-assembled, all of this happening in Germany. Okay, with all of this, what is it that Sennheiser intended for the IE900? What were their sonic goals for their new flagship IEM? I asked the question, and the answer was essentially this. They were pursuing the reproduction of a wide frequency range with exceedingly low distortion and with a neutral reference signature. They were intending to make audible even the subtlest nuances, to have outstanding resolving ability. Now, one of the hallmarks to me of the IE900 sound signature has much to do with those three side volume resonators I was just talking about. That is, to have a driver that can reproduce extended energetic treble, but to carefully sculpt that treble using the three resonators so that as much detail as possible comes through, but only after having masking resonances, having harshness precisely damped out. It's very impressive, too, as the IE900's treble energy pushes out to my limits, but it does so in a manner that's beautifully refined, never imparting its own harshness. The high treble isn't the only area of careful sculpting. It sounds to me like Sennheiser was very careful to prevent the IE900's powerful bass, which is taut and exceedingly controlled, from swelling the lower mid-range. And that's a very good thing, as bloat there can lead to muddiness and a veiled character. The IE900 is outstanding in this regard, entirely preventing this type of bloat to my ears. Now, when it comes to EQing headphones, I do that regularly when I'm using Rune on my desktop systems. In portable rigs, though, EQing options can be very limited or non-existent depending on what you're using. And one area I tend to EQ on headphones, and more commonly on in-ears for some reason, is the presence region. Now, Harman targeted earphones in particular sometimes present with too much presence region energy and emphasis for my tastes. Sometimes reducing clarity, compressing the sense of space, and sounding too... too busy. So I'll sometimes take the presence region down a bit, being careful not to sacrifice vocal detail, vocal clarity, while gaining a greater sense of space. This is one of my favorite aspects of the Sennheiser IE900 sound. It's more open sounding already, and I feel no need to EQ the presence region down, which is a blessing, especially when I'm going portable without a practical means to EQ precisely. And of course, we've already talked about the treble where that three side volume absorber design does its magic to give me the energy, air, and precision up top without any artificial bite of its own. No earphone imparted sibilance either. All in all, even when I'm using one of my desktop rune setups, I find myself bypassing the EQ more often with the IE900 than I do many other earphones. It's superb and absolutely one of my new reference IEMs. 
Now, a couple of other Universal Fit IEMs I've been carrying with me a lot since they were released include the Sony IER-M9, which I often prefer to Sony's flagship IER-Z1R, and the QDC Anoli VX. Now, I no doubt consider these two models reference IEMs. They're also very highly regarded IEMs in our community, and deservedly so. In my opinion, the IE900 brings Sennheiser into that reference IEM stratum, that top-tier league, and I expect it will be another constant companion of mine. At HeadFi HQ, Brian, who goes by Axel Chloris on the forums, Brian and I rarely agree on headphones. Headphones he loves, I sometimes find too lean and too trebly. Headphones I love, he sometimes finds too boomy and too smoothed over. Occasionally, though, we find common ground, some headphones magically bridging our preferences and satisfying both of our tastes. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. A couple of examples include the Sennheiser HE1, which I think we both feel is the best sounding headphone in the world, bar none. Another example is the Audio-Technica ATH-ADX5000, which is Audio-Technica's flagship open-back over-ear that has a unique, beautiful signature that I'd characterize as a smooth, bright signature, and that we both take turns using. The IE900 joins that uncommon, special group of headphones that serve as references for both of us. Anyway, if you get a chance, make sure to give a listen to the new Sennheiser IE900. Listen with your ears more than your eyes, and don't hold it up to the Harman Target, or any other target for that matter, just listen to it. That said, I know you're all interested in seeing the Sennheiser IE900's measurements, so here they are. I should first mention that these Sennheiser IE900 measurements were made using the Care 5128, which is the most human-like ear simulator standard, and what we've transitioned to is our primary headphone measurement fixture. It's the first hearing simulator that simulates adult human hearing across the full audio range from 20 Hz to 20 kHz. Now, if you want to learn more about the Care 5128, make sure to check the description or the accompanying forum post, and I'll include a link to a video in which I explain the 5128 in some detail. Let's start, of course, by looking at the frequency response measurement of the new Sennheiser IE900. This is using the stock medium-sized silicone ear tips. This is the Sennheiser IE900's THD, or Total Harmonic Distortion measurement, at 90 dB SPL. In this measurement you're looking at now, we're comparing the Sennheiser IE900 frequency response to the frequency response of the Sennheiser IE800S it replaces. As you can see, there are significant differences between them. Again, in terms of how these sound to me, I find the IE900 a substantial improvement over the IE800S. And here you can see the Sennheiser IE900's THD compared to the IE800's THD, making clear that there are definite improvements made with the newer flagship in terms of distortion, too. One of the nice things about the new Care 5128 is how it allows us to make better comparisons between headphones and earphones. The reason the 5128 makes for a better comparison is because, first of all, we're measuring both types of headphones, over-ear and in-ear, on the same human, an averaged human. And what's also critical is that the anatomy of this averaged human is far more human-like than any previous fixture of its type. For example, the ear canal has the first and second bends because the entire canal is simulated with an average of the complex and varying cross-sectional dimensions of adult human ear canals. The 5128's ear canal even simulates the bonier condition of the canal as you get closer to the eardrum. And also very importantly, the 5128's eardrum characteristics are far more human-like, and it terminates the canal at a realistic incline. Okay, all that said, let's compare the IE900 to some popular over-ears. Here's the IE900 compared to the Sennheiser HD650. Here's the Sennheiser IE900 compared to the Sennheiser HD800S. I tend to EQ my in-ears and over-ears differently, and I usually do it by ear, with my own ears, of course, using a parametric equalizer. Comparing the IE900 to these over-ears is very interesting for me, as its sound signature reflects some of the changes I commonly make to over-ears, generally speaking, using a parametric EQ. And that's the Sennheiser IE900. The Sennheiser IE900 is being announced today and should be available soon in the coming weeks. Thanks for watching this episode of HeadFi TV. I'll see you next time and on the forums at headfi.org.